Thank you, Dr. Wu. Well, I'm excited to be able to address this group. Um, I, of course, have done grand rounds here and there, but never to lab medicine group. And I feel as if this is the group that really does what I aspire to do. So I'm eager to get your feedback. So about almost 15 years ago, uh, Chuck Drescher, who's a gynecologic oncologist in this city, and I were inspired to see what we could do about ovarian cancer, in part because Saul Rifkin, who's a breast oncologist, lost his wife to ovarian cancer. And we thought about the problem and decided that early detection was the best bet for trying to attack this particular disease. So the obvious reason is that the survival is better uh, when the disease is detected early. I want to point out that it's really the serous histology that is the most in need of early detection, that the other histologies are already detected, not 100% um, early, but at least half of them are detected early, whereas only a quarter of the serous histology are collected early. And I think we really have to find them in stage one if we have any idea of curing them. So even the high-grade serous tumors do do well if they are the, even the, um, the high-grade stage one serous do do well if they're detected early. So, so even the highest grade have about a 60% mortality, mortality at or survival at 10 years. So there's a couple of new developments since I began doing this work. One of them is that Chris Crum uh, has pointed out <laughs> that actually what we think of as serous ovarian cancer may originate in the fallopian tube. And this really, in retrospect, shouldn't have been such a surprise. It, the reason that we know about it now is because of the BRCA1 and 2 mutations and all the prophylactic, prophylactic ovarectomies that are being done. So that's enabled everybody to look at the material that's removed. And, and you know, 15, 20 percent of these women do have either a malignancy or some kind of a pre-malignant condition. A, a tick um, is particularly what he's been looking at, the tubal intraepithelial carcinoma which I'm sure is familiar to all of you. But um, in 55 consecutive pelvic serous carcinoma cases where they did the complete exam, they found that 75% of them were positive for, for the tubes. And um, this is really changing the way we think about what we need to do if we want to try to detect ovarian cancer early. Pat Brown uh, has become involved in all of this through a foundation called Canary recently, and uh, he challenged us and said, I don't think there's any way that you can ever find markers that will detect anything as small as we need to detect. So he uh, reviewed the literature and kind of modeled this and basically um, concluded that there is disease there for about four years. It, so we have plenty of time to detect it. The problem is that we don't have any markers that will detect something that's two centimeters. So this is, this is the challenge that we're dealing with. So many years ago, we decided to try to do this, and we envisioned this whole pipeline that we would identify the markers, then we would validate them, and then we would uh, put them together use several of them together was our idea that we'd put together a panel and then have a screening program. So I'm going to tell you how much progress we have made in that. Um, so we started working with Lee Hood, who at that time was at the university. This was before the days of proteomics. He and I knew that what we needed was proteomics, but it didn't exist. Um, even the cDNA microarray technology was brand new. So uh, we, but we were good at collecting the tumors. Chuck Drescher did that, so we had plenty of cases. We had some benign tumors and some healthy tissue. Now, we did not get the epithelial cells from the surface of the ovary, which people for a while thought would have been a better idea, but we did have the benign epithelial tumors for comparison. So we were trying to identify markers that were um, overexpressed only in malignancy. So we, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all of that work, but we did find a lot, and then we took the top candidates, and we took the five women for whom we had serum, serum who, that was negative on CA125. So these were the same women, because we always get blood samples when we get tissue. So we looked for the markers that were overexpressed 
um, the, where you see the little asterisks, that's the um, transcript level work. Some of these others are in serum. But basically, what we, we chose the ones that looked most promising. Slippy, um, IFI 27, that's actually IFI 27, not P27. We just were ignorant and didn't call it by the right name back in those days. And um, also HE4 and uh, mesothelin. But we chose those markers as our top markers to try to develop assays for. But we also did attack these others, CD24, GPR39, et cetera. So we, we set out to develop assays. So with HE4 and mesothelin, we were very fortunate that we worked with um, the Hellstrom Laboratory, which at that time was at PNRI, now, now they're here at UW. But uh, we developed very good assays for HE4 and mesothelin using monoclonal <coughs> antibodies that were developed in the Hellstrom laboratory. And they have since been um, taken over somehow by Fujiribio, who has licensed them. They, these are the same antibodies that are currently used in the Fujiribio assays, which are now, um, HE4 is FDA approved, that assay on three clinical platforms, Abbott, Roche, and BD Tripath. So, so the first um, ELISA we developed was for the gene WFDC2, called the HE4 protein. And we found that it was as sensitive as CA125 and more specific, negative in nearly all of the controls. So we were very excited about this particular marker from the beginning. Mesothelin, we also developed an assay for, and it has not gone as far in this country. It is used for um, detection of mesothelioma in other countries, not here. I think Australia and England, Europe, somewhere. So also at this time, we, we, tried, we came up with a method for developing what we call a composite marker these days, uh, which is sort of a weighted average of adding up the markers. And how you get the weights is to use log logistic regression analysis. And Marty McIntosh and, and Margaret Pepe, who are statisticians, wrote a paper saying that this was as good a way as any to combine markers. So I'm not going to get, tell you all of the results of all of the work we did in clinical samples. We did a lot. <laughs> but really, what we need to do is work in preclinical samples, because when you use the clinical samples, these women have huge tumors. They were symptomatic. When your marker works in symptomatic women, that does not imply that it will work six months, a year, three years earlier when the tumor is very small, is when you really need to be detecting it. So um, this, this diagram kind of says it all about how you might use some markers. And one thing that I wanted to point out, but I can't make my cursor work, is that really, in some ways, I'm coming to the conclusion what we need to do is cancer prevention. If we could come up with some way to identify the women who were at very, very high risk of this disease, we could remove their fallopian tubes. I mean, we do, BRCA1 and 2 are like this, and these women are at very high risk, so we remove, remove everything, ovaries, fallopian tubes, everything. But it's, you know, that's considered um, with some adverse possible consequences because of HRT, et cetera. But if we could just remove the fallopian tubes and reduce the risk a lot, that, that might actually be the way to go. But meanwhile, we're still trying to figure out screening. So what we need is um, preclinical samples. So this, what I'm going to talk about really for the rest of this talk is what we're doing with preclinical samples. And so there's two papers I'm going to talk about. These are really the first two papers that are coming out using preclinical samples. So we, we will look eventually at WHI samples and uh, UK samples. But right now, the, the first sam study we did was in carrot samples, which is small. So carrot was a lung cancer prevention study that you may remember. <laughs> where they were trying to prevent lung cancer. It did not work. Um, <laughs> but they have some samples that they stored. And so there were 34 cases of ovarian cancer. And this little diagram shows you the proximity of the, the blood draws to the diagnosis of the case. So you can see that in quite a lot of these 34 cases, there's, you know, there were five years or more between the last blood draw and that. But there's about 10 where, where the blood draw is within two years. Um, the closest blood draw is within two years of the diagnosis. So this is kind of a difficult set to work with. It's, it's small, and it's not 
um, doesn't make it easy. So this is what was in the set, mostly their uh, stage 3C cirrus, which is what you see in general in the population. So the first question that we asked, this work was done with Garnet Anderson, a statistician with the WHI, in fact. And she viewed this study as sort of a precursor to looking at all this in WHI samples. So the first thing she wanted to know was how early did these markers give signal? And she, she, there's in the paper, this is published, and in the paper she looked at six markers, um, not just CA125 and HE4, but I didn't have time to show it all to you. You can look at the paper, but the bottom line here is that, that these are the best markers, CA125 and HE4, and they, give, they begin to rise maybe three years before diagnosis, but um, they wouldn't reach a threshold that you could call positive until about a year prior to diagnosis. So Garnet considered that disappointing. Um, I think Barb Goff thought that that was encouraging. If you could detect the cancer a year earlier, that that would be a good thing. So it's kind of in your perspective. These are the ROC curves uh, reflecting the same thing. Um, a is CA125, B is HE4. And the highest ROC curve is the cases that were within two years of diagnosis. And then the blue is two to four, and the green is four or more years prior to diagnosis. So you, that, that behaves about the way that you would expect. And here we put together a composite marker, including mesothelin as well. And um, it does a little bit better than the individual markers, but not a lot. And in a way, this is the sad message of my whole talk, is that when you put together uh, a panel of markers, panel just being really a list of what they are, and then there's different ways to combine them. But really nobody has been able to put together a panel that works much better than CA125 alone. That is the story in the end, um, but I can tell you the long version of it, and also tell you toward the end what we're doing that we hope will be clinically useful despite this. So could these markers work for risk? And the answer is yes. But Garnet was disappointed here, too, because we're not seeing very high um, effects. So, so there's effects, but they're not very high. And they're not high enough to be statistically significant when you use the baseline sample. Okay, so for risk, you know, it's, it, that's fine to use a blood sample that's at some distance from the diagnosis. What is encouraging is that most of these markers, with the exception of... Um, a couple that we got from Diadexis. At the time that we wrote this paper, we were collaborating with a company called Diadexis, and they had these three markers, B7H4, DCR3, and Spondin2. And so we included them in this study, and they, two of them really did not work especially well. But you can see that um, actually Spondin2 has the highest, the 0.39 is the highest of, of these markers. So the take home message here is that they all are in the ones that work, the good ones, are giving some signal way in advance, but nowhere near enough to do anything with it. I mean, there's just not enough that you would be able to use it clinically. Um, so, in, the, in what I'm presenting for, from the carrot data, I'm including a marker MMP7, which was not included in the paper. And you probably know more about MMP7 than I do. I won't spend a lot of time on it. But um, because it's not described in the paper, I uh, included a slide on it. But it has been much studied. It's not as if we pulled it out of the air. Uh, and we added it to our list of markers to look at because it looked promising on the basis of the literature and also some some work that, of our own that I'm not presenting today. So, so the tables that I'm showing you from CARAT include MNP7, but when you go to the paper, it's not there. So long about this time, too, we um, developed a longitudinal algorithm. So, so what everybody realized pretty early on was with CA125, as with um, PSA, you can do better by looking at change over time in the marker for, for a variety of reasons. One of them is that a lot of these markers tend to vary much more among individuals than within a woman over time. When you look at, if you take blood samples a year apart over a period of time or six months apart over a period of time, the correlation between any two is really quite high. And uh, 
Whereas if you look at the effect of covariance on marker levels, just about all these markers are affected by at least two, sometimes three or four, covariates, age, um, using HRT, BMI, whatever. So by, by looking at a woman's level at the current screen relative to what it has been in the past, you can do better than just having a standard cutoff like 35 for CA125. So we refer to that single um, cutoff as a single threshold rule, population-based single threshold rule. And the other we refer to as our PR, either rising CA125 or rising HE4 or as the PEB, interpreted with the PEB. So these are the main data that came out of that CARAT study with MMP7 added. So there's two sides to this. Um, on the left are what Garnet called the standardized estimates. So this is a single threshold rule, but it's defined in a peculiar way. We, we wanted to be able to compare the coefficients. Statisticians drive laboratory people crazy, I apologize. But we wanted to be able to compare the coefficients. We didn't want to have different units of measurement for each marker, because then it's really hard to compare them just by looking at the coefficients. So we measured all of the markers standardized, which means we looked at the mean and the standard deviation in the controls, and then just used the deviation from that measured in standard deviations for, the, for everybody. So, so you, can, you can compare these. So these are hazards, hazard ratios. On the left are the single threshold rule, and on the right are the change over time, uh, essentially rising. So I, I, put, I listed these in order by the size of the hazard ratio in terms in just summarizing what we learned. So the analysis of these serial samples this is all the serial samples now, not, not just the baseline samples. It, it suggests that elevated or rising levels, elevated on the left, rising on the right, of MMP7, mesothelial one spondin 2 HE4, CA125, and B7H4 all predict diagnosis of ovarian cancer statistically, significantly. So this is good, and if you, know, if you care, if you like to put weight on statistical significance rather than the size of the effect, you can see that CA125 and MMP7 are the two that have very, the hot, most highly statistically significant. Now I will point out, it's down here in blue, that these, these estimates are not actually the full PEB. They're really more like a change score, because the real PEB uses the average of all of the prior history, so that it's asking if the, if the current value is, is higher than you would expect based on what it's been in the past over several screens. Whereas, and even though we had several screens available, Garnet chose to use only the most recent prior screen. And the reason that she did that is because she viewed this as a pilot for the WHI, and in the WHI data, we only have two. So in the observational study in the WHI, they took a blood sample at baseline and three years later, and in the clinical trial, they had a blood sample at baseline and one year later. And we will be looking at those samples. We, have, we actually have done the OS already, but I can't present those to you because everything has to go through a million committees with the WHI. But um, because she was using these data to justify getting the, the samples from WHI. She did it this way. So, but it, honestly, it wouldn't be much different if you used the full history. I did it myself. It doesn't really make any difference. Um, so we did a second study that uh, was collaborative. So this was with the PLCO trial. Now, in some ways, the CARAT study is better because there was no screening going on in CARAT. So it's pure. The problem with these samples from the PLCO trial is that screening was going on, and they did not collect any samples from the control group, which is very unfortunate. They only collected the samples that they needed to screen the women. So, but they did at least store them, and they did make them available to us. And what I had requested was the serial samples, because the whole point is that I wanted to look at change over time in these markers. But by the time they actually gave me the samples, they had all these other people involved in it, and they, they didn't want to give 
out their serial samples when there was really not that much evidence that these markers worked. So they only gave us the proximate sample, even though we begged for the baseline, press the proximate, but no. We only got the proximate sample. So that's what we had to live with. So we had 119 cases uh, with approximate sample. And, but the, most of the diagnoses were very close to that proximate sample. So more than half of them, about half of them, were six months, within six months. So, you know, we don't have, um, it's a very different picture from CARAT. With CARAT, the problem is we don't have any, very many samples close to diagnosis. With PLCO, we have almost all of the samples very close to diagnosis. So, because this was a screening trial, and so if they had elevated CA125, they used CA125 over 35. And they were also doing ultrasound in every woman, every year. And if either one was positive, the woman had a surgical referral. So then there were 951 controls that they sent to us, to the laboratory. We actually only used half of them, which is why I have the rest of them in blue here. We only used the 475, what's called general population <laughs> controls, what that is, is, is controls that were just randomly sampled from the entire trial population among the women who are not diagnosed with ovarian cancer. They had these special um, controls too, and we were of course blinded, they just sent us them. So we do have the data from the other controls, but we didn't use it for these analyses. So what I'm going to present to you here, we, we blind everything, this was you know, done in collaboration with other people, including the EDRM. So this was the four spores. I have a spore, Specialized Program of Research Excellence from NCI, in ovarian cancer. And at the time that this was funded, or that begun, there were four funded spores. So all of us participated. Um, but EDRN also uh, got into the game here. And they, so they did some data management. They sort of coordinated the data. Uh, we had five different specimen sites originally including University of Alabama at Birmingham, but they were not refunded for their spores, so they kind of dropped out of this. Um, and then assay sites. So there were three, each of us had assays that we were bringing to this work. We wanted to see if they would work in these preclinical samples. Um, at Harvard, which is partners, later it gets referred to as partners for some reason, um, they used automated platforms as much as possible. And when they didn't have an automated platform, they used uh, plate-based ELISA. So their HE4 assay was the FDA-approved plate, original plate-based ELISA with the antibodies that we had developed years ago. What I did was bead-based assays mostly, but single-plex. So I had developed all these bead-based assays to be specimen efficient so that the WHI would give me their samples. Um, so I was using bead-based uh, bead, bead technology, but I didn't try to multiplex because in my experience, you lose something when you try to multiplex. And then analoxion was multiplexing. So, so these are the assays that uh, we measured ourselves here in what we call a TOR laboratory. Um, and I don't have time to really talk to you much about them. But suffice it to say that the first five were bead-based and the last two were ones that we kind of added. Well, the MMP7, we added the same way we added it to PLCO. And IGFBP2 was suggested to us, I think, by Sam Hanash, and there was an assay available for it. So we, we did include it, too. So we, those were just kits. But the others, the CA125, we have a published paper that describes our assay. It actually works very, very well. It's CLIA approved. HE4 and mesothelin and SLIPI, we used a very unusual technology for assay development, which we use these biobodies, <laughs> which are in vivo biotinylated recombinant antibodies that are a CFV that are pulled out of a yeast display library. And if you have questions about it, David can tell you about it, or I can tell you in a different forum. But um, we spent a lot of time developing these assays. So these are the results. I'm going to show you the results from each of the five sites. So these are the results for our, our assays. So the, the, um, the bottom line is that CA125 and HG4 perform well. The rest of the markers really don't perform particularly well. And we broke this down by within six months of diagnosis, six to 12 months of diagnosis, um, 12 to 18, and more than 18 months. And these are all at a specificity of 95%. So 
the, the first thing that you can see, the first line is, how, is the CA-125 PLCO assay. So this is what they did in the PLCO trial. And it performs very, very well um, within a year of diagnosis, which of course is because when it was positive, then women got diagnosed. Um, but, and then the very last part of this table is um, the all-site panel. So the theory behind this work was that we were going to pool all of our markers and pick out the best ones of everybody's and come up with a composite marker that would be the best. And unfortunately, the, the, this, is a, this paper is in press, so it will, the Kramer paper and the Zhu paper, and I think the panel's actually described in the Zhu paper. But um, the, really, HE4 did add something to CA125, but the rest of the markers added, it was not very robust. You could do it different ways and you'd add, put in different markers. <laughs> HE4 was always the, the next best marker and it was worth it to include it sort of marginally. But the, the other three that got included were SLPI, CA, CA724, and beta-2 microglobin. And um, well, I'll, t I'll talk about a little bit more, but it uh, didn't really help that much. I mean, the idea was to try to get earlier detection. We put weight on the earlier, the, one, the cases that were further from diagnosis to try to pick up the cases that were being missed by CA125. Um, but anyway, you can see that we're not doing great. I mean, the sensitivity of CA125, the sensitivity is, there's, you know, it's kind of hard to read because there's the um, AUC curve and then there's the sensitivity next, and then in parens is the 95% confidence interval. But see, our CA125 assay was 0.8 sensitive within six months. HE4 was 0.6. MMP7 was 0.2. Mesothelone was 0.4. And then they get lower as you get further from diagnosis. So we were, with close to diagnosis, we were doing okay, but we were not doing, we weren't really we were certainly weren't doing better than CA125. And when you got out to the earlier, which is where we really hoped maybe we would see our markers doing better, I think the best that any marker did more than 18 months was 0.15. We had three that had 0.12 sensitivity more than 18 months from diagnosis, but it was not impressive. And um, Slippy does not look particularly good here. And you know why it was included in the panel, I cannot tell you. But so then, if you look at the partners, so partners was working with assays that are known and loved and used for other things for the most part, and their theirs was not a lot better. Their HE4 assay was better than mine, the plate-based assay, and so their sensitivity was 0.73 within six months of diagnosis, which was um, a little bit better. My, I think I had 0.6 and. Their CA125 assay was also good, um, but you know the re the rest of them were were a little better. So they had 0.44 on the CA724, 0.36 on the B7H4, 15.3 was 0.45, um, but. Moving forward, what, when they put together the panel, they used the CA125 that was used in the trial, because all the CA125s worked comparably, and that was more consistent, it seemed, to do. And then we used the partner's plate-based assay for, for HE4. So what's really interesting is the rest of these markers. So, so MD Anderson and also NCI had, were working with Cyphergen and they had this panel that's really a proteomics panel. It's the only sort of proteomics panel in here. And uh, really these markers you can see did not perform well at all. Um, really any of them, even, with, even within six months of diagnosis. You know, we're talking about sensitivities less than 0.1 for the most part. Um, they actually do, you know, the, the 0.18 at more than 18 months is, is uh, MIF. So this is Overshore. So this is from MD Anderson. This is the OVA1 test. And this is the one that's proteomics. And it, it did not pr perform well. It's, the B2M was the best one at 0.15. Maybe I did say that. And then Yale, at Yale, the only one that, 
has any, well, this, yeah, I'm sorry. I think I somehow skipped this slide. So, so this is the overshore. And overshore, MIF is um, at 0.18 within six months, but, and also 0.18 over 18 months, but it's um, zero in the in-between years. I mean, basically, it's not um, looking very good. And none of these markers contributed to a panel. So let me just go back because I kind of screwed this up a little bit. So, so from the B2M did perform best and was included in the panel, the best panel. From Yale, none of the markers were included in the panel. And from Pittsburgh, none of the markers were included in the panel. And the Pittsburgh markers did not perform well either. HE4 is the only one with 0.31 within six months. So um, the bottom line on this study is it's disappointing. So what's wrong? Why? Why have we spent a decade trying to find markers <laughs> to detect ovarian cancer early, only to conclude that the best marker is CA125 in the end, and that at best we have one additional marker that'll help a little? Well, one problem is the samples that we've been using for the discovery and the validation in the clinical sample. So this is just a quick example of that. So. Um, when the paper came out from Gilmore and Vicentin and everybody, I looked at it and thought, well, prolactin looks terrific. I mean, it was it just the, the ROC curve was like better than CA125. It was incredible. So I got um, an assay for it, and I measured it in my samples to see you know, if it really would work. And we had already measured MIF working with somebody else. So we, um, we wanted to see if maybe what the problem could be is the conditions of the blood draw. And <laughs> the way the samples that we use, even though we were doing the same thing everybody else was doing, which is that the cases mostly are collected in surgery, the blood from the cases, whereas the, the blood samples that come from the controls are mostly collected in an outpatient setting. These are women who are participating in some screening study or something. So, but we also had women with benign disease that is something wrong with their ovaries, but not malignant. And we had surgical controls who were just having fibroids um, removed, who had nothing wrong with their ovaries. But for, we would try to get a blood sample prior to in, in the, at the um, pre-op visit, in addition to the blood sample that we got in surgery. And so what this shows you, the little red dots are all of the ones that were collected in surgery. And the blue dots are the ones that were collected in an outpatient setting. And you can see that prolactin is a great marker for having your blood collected in surgery. <laughs> now, why that would be the case, you know, you can speculate rather than me. Um, but in the, so these are from that paper, the, R, the ROC curves for CA125, MIF, and prolactin, where the dotted line is kind of like the naive ROC curve if you just compare everything that you have to everything else. Um, and then the, I'm sorry, the, yeah, we have within, the naive comparison is the dotted line and the within condition comparisons are the other two solid lines. So you can see that prolactin actually, when you look within condition of the blood draw, is not really giving any signal in malignancy. So there was a lesson learned there. And you know, a lot of the early work, a lot of the proteomics work, they got their samples from David Fishman, who, you know, the controls came from screening study, and the cases were obtained in women who were going to surgery. And it's not easy to get the blood draw at a pre-op visit for reasons that are hard to explain, but it, it's a challenge, we try. So here we are, we have CA125. <laughs> so how good is CA125? Can we do anything with it? Well, um, there's two trials that are going on, efficacy trials that have reported some interim results, and uh, CA125 is looking good. You know, when the UK trial, I don't know how familiar you are with these trials, but there's one in the UK that's a, actually a three-arm trial. They have 200,000 women in this trial, 100,000 of them get no screening. Of the ones who do get screening, half of them get this multimodal strategy that's what Ian Jacobs really wanted to test, and then 50,000 of them get uh, ultrasound alone as a first-line screen because the imaging people just could not believe that a serum test could work. That they just thought you have, you know, you do so much better with imaging. It's a shame to do this trial and not do imaging. Well, this is the right audience to hear. You know what? <laughs> the blood test works better than the imaging. 
And it's actually not that surprising, especially for early detection, because you know, by the time something big enough that you see it on transvaginal ultrasound, it's, the woman probably has um, advanced disease. But even not taking that into consideration, even just looking at the sensitivity and the specificity uh, and the PPV, comparing the two arms in this UK trial, this, the CA125, they use, it's in the multimodal strategy, they use CA125 to select the women for ultrasound. And then the idea is if, if both are positive, so they don't do the ultrasound unless the CA125 is positive. And if both are positive, then the woman gets surgical referral. Greatly improves your specificity. Their specificity is 99.8%. They're only sending three women to surgery for every cancer they find, which is incredible. Um, but their sensitivity is 89.5. Now, this is at the prevalence screen, but still I find it almost unbelievable that they could be doing that well. But one thing that Ian has told me is that if the CA125 is rising compellingly, they do um, refer a woman to surgery in the face of a negative ultrasound. And I think that that is helping them to do better than they would otherwise. Um, in the ultrasound alone arm, their, their sensitivity of the prevalence screen was 75, their specificity is 98.2, and their positive predictive value was only 2.8, which is the big problem in ovarian cancer. It's rare. So it's, you know, you really need your specificity to be around 99.6 in the general postmenopausal population in order to keep your positive predictive value down. Um, so you're not sending more than 10 women to surgery for every cancer that you find. The PLCO trial in this country, the results are very consistent. I mean, they, they're not, they're just not doing very well. They're doing both CA125 and sonography at every screen. If either one's positive, the woman, there's a surgical referral recommended, but um, they only had 68% sensitivity at the first four screens. Um, and about 5% of women are positive at each screen, so their specificity is like 95%, they're doing 20 surgeries for every cancer detected. So this is some data that is unpublished, and um, this is my best idea of what to do in the face of uh, markers that are not that great. So I thought, well, they're not, we have not been able to put together a panel as a first-line screen that's better than CA125 alone. So maybe, though, since imaging is so appallingly bad, Maybe it would be the case that HE4 or some other marker would work better than imaging as a second line screen because the same logic applies that the reason that you can get really good specificity when you have a first line screen and then only when it's positive you do the second line screen, the reason that that works is because the the two are sort of independent in the controls, or at least the more independent they are in the controls, the better you'll be able to do with respect to specificity. Because you're not finding the same, the things that are causing false positives on CO125 are not the same things that are causing false positives on sonography. So what this um, shows you is we, in 84 PLCO cases, there were 34 that had positive CA125 based on their criteria. So this is CA125 over 35. So we asked the question about, of all of our markers, could we do better than ultrasound as the second line screen? Well, happily, we had ultrasound data. The PLCO on the first four screens, they did ultrasound in every woman every year. There were two more screens where they just dropped the ultrasound because it wasn't working very well. But those first four years of screening is what this is based on. So we have the ultrasound data for all of the women, which was handy. So we looked to see, well, what's the story? So this confirmatory test positive um, column is less relevant, but the, the, the relevant one is the third one. So this is where both of the tests are positive. So the, the first line says of the 34 that were positive on CA125, 16 of them were also positive on ultrasound. So if you use that decision rule that they have to both be positive, you would only find 16 of the cases this way. So then we asked, well, do any of our other markers make this look better? And our own CA125 assay actually does best. If you used our own CA125 assay as a second line screen, 32 of the cases would be identified. And our, then we looked at our own HE4 assay and Harvard. So the best one here is Harvard's. Harvard, you'd find 26, which is a lot more. 26 is more than 16 of the cases would have been um, referred for uh, surgical consult. And this is statistically significant, the 0.0245. So 
then, and I already said this, so I'm skipping this. Then we th thought, well, to really be fair about this, because the specificities are not being held constant there, what we really need is the specificity to be 99.6 for the overall strategy. So we said, OK, we're going to use the PLCO samples and data to retrospectively validate some decision rules saying, what if in the PLCO they had screened in this particular way, how well would they have done uh, with respect to sensitivity? And we're holding constant the overall specificity, which means we had to tinker with the sensitivity of the individual markers. And I'm not telling you all that because I don't have time. But what we found was that when you, we used um, CA125 here at a 95% specificity level, so it was a little bit um, different. But at any rate, when we used the CA125 to select women for imaging, we got 20 of 84 cases. When we used rising CA125, we increased that to 22 of 84 cases, still using imaging as a second line screen. For the rest of them, we just only used rising CA125. When we used HE4, we got 27. So it's 27 compared to 22. When we used the really <laughs> appalling thing here is when we just used rising CA125 alone, period, at 99.6% specificity, it, it did really the best. It found 31 of the 84 cases. But the last two are essentially equivalent. And the difference is 31 to 30 to 29 are not very great. So these last two are the ones that I'm kind of moving forward with. So here we use CA125 to select women for both HE4 and imaging. And the rule is if two of the three tests are positive, then the women get surgical consult. And we identify 30 of the 84 cases that way. Or you can use HE4 in the first line screen and say if we use rising CA125 and HE4. We couldn't measure rising HE4 because we only had proximate samples. So this is just a single threshold role in HE4 to select the women for imaging. Um, with two or three tests positive, we identify 29 of 84. So I think probably I should just quit now. I do. The rest of my slides are about a randomized controlled trial, and because we need some time for discussion. But the I do have a, a trial. It's open here in Seattle, and it, uh, for three other sites, and there'll be a fourth one. So it's open at the Hutch at Cedars in LA, Stanford, City of Hope, also in LA, and Fox Chase is going to open in March. And um, this trial is designed really based on the data that I just showed you. And we're taking advantage of CA125 being working really well. But we're also, it's a randomized phase one trial. And in one arm, we introduce HE4 as the second line screen. And in the other arm, we introduce it as a first line screen. And of course, since it's a phase one trial, we're not looking at efficacy. We're looking at um, safety. So we look at the positive predictive value and effects on quality of life compliance. Um, and we have three different risk groups. So most people, when they do screening trials for ovarian cancer, they either focus on the high risk women or the average risk postmenopausal women. But I put them all together. But I do screen them at different intervals. So the, the women with the family history or mutation are screened every six months. And then the um, more average risk women um, are screened every year. But even in risk group three, I call this um, a trial in high risk women. Even in the lowest risk group, they have to have some kind of risk factors. So um, what we're doing so far is to use prior elevation. So if the woman has a, a single elevation in any one of the four markers, C125, HE4, mesothelin, or MMP7, then she can be eligible for that third risk group. These are just eligibility requirements that you're probably familiar with for women with a family history that would warrant genetic testing. Um, the surgical consult, re so we randomize within the risk groups. The surgical consult are critical. So if the, if the CA125 PEB rule is above the 99% um, threshold of what you would expect, then the woman gets surgical consult. So 1% of women at every screen will meet this criterion and talk to a surgeon about what should be done about it. So this is um, 
Most of the women who get surgical consult, it's for this reason. The other reasons are that their CA125 and their HE4 are both above a 95% specificity threshold. Um, and that's only 0.2% of the women at each screen, or if the imaging is positive. So the women, if they're positive at the first line screen, they come back for a second line screen. The second line screen, we repeat the markers and do ultrasound. And what we expect here is 93 protocol indicated surgeries and 10 screen detected. This, these are, uh, this is our experience to date in this trial. So we have um, what our goal is and what, has, what we've experienced so far in enrollment. So we have, um, we want to enroll 1,200 women. We've only enrolled about 500. So far, we've had one true positive, one false positive, and one false negative. <laughs> so the false negative was actually a woman who went to prophylactic oophorectomy. She was a mutation carrier. And we screened her, and her markers were not positive. And then four months later, she went for prophylactic oophorectomy and a fallopian tube malignancy was found. So she, was not, she didn't become symptomatic, but she's, she's a, um, a false negative. She's a false negative. Then we have one false positive, which was also a mutation carrier. And she had positive markers, and she went to surgery, and no cancer was found. And then our one true positive was actually a risk group three woman. She was a woman who had elevated HE4. Two years earlier, she had participated in a breast cancer study that we had done and given permission for us to invite her for other studies and do whatever we wanted with her blood. So we tested her blood for our four markers, and she was elevated on AG4. 2008, we brought her, we invited her to participate in this trial, and at her first screen, <laughs> She had CA125 over 200. We brought her back for a confirmatory, and it was over 250. By then, her HG4 was also positive because we could look. We looked at the um, change over time, and she went to ultrasound, and it was positive, and she had malignancy, and it was very low volume. It was probably a total of five centimeters, but it was disseminated a bit, so she had a little bit um, on the momentum, and she's so she's stage 3C. But we're hopeful that she'll do better than she would have if she was not symptomatic. Um, so that's the story on the trial. And this is my very last slide, is we could also think about symptoms. But I'm going to not talk about that, because it's just not really time. So in closing, you know, we've done all this research, we and many other people. And the bottom line is CA125 remains the best marker. And we only get modest improvement when we add a second marker. Imaging does not perform as well as CA125 as a first-line screen or even as well as HE4 as a second-line screen based on the PLCO data. Now, we want to validate that particular finding in the UK trial because the UK trial didn't do ultrasound in everybody, but they did do ultrasound in everybody who had rising CA125. So we um, have requested those samples. They have agreed to give them to us and ultimately we'll probably really get them. And then we'll be able to look and see by measuring HE4 in those same samples. And they even have confirmed it because they bring women back the way that they screen. They bring women back for a confirmatory screen and look for rising CA125. So we'll have two samples from the women who had positive CA125. And we'll be able to see you know, if, it, if we can validate. Because even though this was a retrospective study, you can't really call it a validation study. It was the first time that we looked at these decision rules. So, um, so, and change over time in the marker does improve things. So I work with many, many people here. There's the, the whole team from PLCO, the whole team from the other ovarian spores, the Canary Foundation group, which includes Pat Brown, who's really focused on this now, which is terrific. He's, he's doing some interesting work. Um, he's gotten into it and uh, my own lab and the, the group that's working on the novel markers trial uh, and my, my um, statistical colleagues and gynecologic oncologist Chuck Drescher, without whom I could do nothing, and Robin Anderson, who's the psychologist who does the QOL work. So I thank you very much. We have a couple minutes for questions. That was a lot. Yeah. That was a great talk. Um, can I, so part of early detection assumes that we're going to change lives. We're going to make them better. Outcomes for CA125 screening, 
does it help outcomes or does rising actually improve outcomes? Is there any data to show that? There isn't that? yet, no. I mean, you know, the, the, these trials will report their results within, they're supposed to be done in 2014. So, you know, we'll probably know something by then, um, at least by 2015. The, they're, being, they're not, you know, they did publish this one early results, but they haven't said anything, of course, about mortality reduction. But um, I think there's a chance that the UK trial could show a mortality reduction. But I will tell you that I used my, I was trained in um, economics. That's my health services part of my degree. And the first thing that I did before I embarked on any of this was a microsimulation model to see if this could possibly reduce mortality, could possibly be cost effective. And this was published in 1997. This was a long time ago. And um, more recently, I've continued to look at my own model. And Havraleski from, from Duke, who works with Andy Burchak, has published a paper. And we agree. She's published this already. I'm about to publish something consistent. That the mortality reduction that we can expect with the strategy that's being used in the UK is only about 13%. So. You know, if our models are right, we may see a 13% mortality reduction, but that's not going to be statistically significant because it's powered for a 30% mortality reduction. So, uh, you know, I th the trick is to, to see the mortality reduction, you not only have to find the cancers, you have to find them early enough that it makes a difference. And that's what's really hard. Looking at change over time makes a big difference because the, it lowers the effective level for each individual woman on average. So there's a few women who have just very naturally high levels. But say with CON25, when you use a single threshold rule at a specificity of, say, 98, you, it's about 35. But when you use the PEB at the same specificity or the ROCA algorithm, which is what they use in the UK trial, it's the same idea. But um, you lower that threshold. For the average woman, you lower that threshold down to about 20. So in theory, you know, assuming that the marker is rising as the disease progresses, you're finding it earlier. But is it early enough to make a difference? You know, and, the, and I see one of the biggest challenges is the docs don't want to send a woman to surgery on the basis of a CA125 that has gone from 10 to 20. They just don't want to do it. So they wait. And I see this in my own trial. You can see we we've had to, haven't had a lot of false positives. And in the UK, there, you know, they had they had planned it for ten surgeries per cancer found, but they're only doing three. And the reason is, and they see this in PLCO too, is the docs will just don't want to send a woman to surgery on the basis of the CA125 alone, unless they see it up like at a hundred, you know. Then, but when it's only even when it's forty, they're just. They don't want to do that. What are the criteria for rising CA125, and how much biological variation is there? And then kind of as a challenge for the law medicine community, does the CV of our assays, lot lot variation, and so on, does that influence the ability to use the rising threshold significantly? So the first question is, what's the criteria for a rising CA125, and sort of where that fits in with biological variability, within a woman, and then how much does assay variability <coughs> contribute to the variation? Yeah, well, um, Marty McIntosh and I wrote two different papers about how the PEB works, and it really covers this territory. And um, you can't expect, if you have a lousy assay that has a lot of, you know, because when you look at the correlation between those two, you know, a year apart or six months apart, um, some of it's going to be attributable to the assay variability, and then the rest of it is attributable to whatever's going on over time in the woman. Um, and of course, the, the covariates that affect CA125 can also change uh, over time between those two periods. So, but by and large, I, I, with CA125, the correlation between those two points in time is very high. It's over 0 0.8, 0 0.85. Some, we, in our early work, we found over 0 0.9. But it's high. Um, that's published. It's in the, um, the Kramer paper that's in press. We reported the CV, well, we reported, we reported two things, the CVs of all of the assays and the correlation between two points in time in 40 healthy women. So is there an absolute threshold for a rising value 
or is it relative to where the woman was? Well, that's the whole point, that it's relative to where the woman was before. So there is no absolute <coughs> threshold. So it's, it's kind of interesting because what we see is the women, you know, a woman will have a positive CA125, sometimes above the 99% threshold in the novel markers trial that I'm conducting. And what will happen is the clinical people will not want to send her to surgery. So they'll say, well, you'll just cut. we have early recall. So if she has a positive test, she comes back in three months instead of six months. So the, they're very inclined to say, well, let's just wait three months and see you know, if it, what it does in three months. But the PEB, the way the PEB works, the whole point of it is the PEB looks at this and says, oh, well, you know, the assumption is that, it, that what's in the history represents health for this woman. <laughs> so it bumps up her thresholds for positivity. So if, she, if her history consists of values that are in the vicinity of 40, 45, some 60, we've had some up there, then, then the PEB says we're not going to call this positive until we see it up around 85 or 90. And it's actually not that extreme. It's, it requires a rise of maybe 35 percent. But it also sort of depends on the time. But it's, um, it's tricky. It's very tricky. It's, you know, I, and the, you, the um, clinical investigators have to pay attention. I, you know, and some of them are great. And some of them, honestly, are just, they just don't pay any attention. And it just drives me nuts, you know? And I'm like, you have to look at what's happening to these marker levels. You can't just get this report and the PEB says normal when this woman's threshold, it was, it was 60 and you decided not to do anything about it. So now it's coming back at 75 and we're telling you it's normal based on the PEB, but that's based on an assumption that that 60 was, she was healthy then. It's not based on an assumption that it was, you know, beginning to signal disease. So this is this is something that I, you know, the, there's like a slip between the theory and the practice that I'm trying to cope with. I think we're going to change the way we do the PEB a little bit. So maybe exclude values that were over 99% or something to kind of, because um, I just wasn't expecting that the clinical people would just ignore ignore the recommendation and say, let's just bring her back in three months. So 